Hey there, marketing research students. In this brief conversation, we'll introduce some of the key concepts surrounding observational research. There's three key learning outcomes that you should have at the end of this lecture. First, you should be able to explain the pros and cons of observational research. And you should also be able to explain why it's often used for exploratory research in marketing. You should be able to describe the common uses for other types of observational research, typical in marketing research. And finally, you should be able to understand how the four different dimensions of observational research can be used to determine the advantages and risks of a particular observational research technique. So what is observational research? Observational research observes consumer behavior. This is how we collect the data rather than collecting it through communication-based methods, such as survey designs. In reality, observational research and communication-based research are often blended together as each information gathering mechanism is used to complement the limitations of the other. But observational research tends to be superior when it comes time to observing actual human behavior. Observational research comes in a variety of different forms, each tailored to solve the particular research question it's facing. However, we can usually characterize any observational research technique across four different dimensions. And by understanding the, the properties a particular design approach has across those four dimensions helps us understand the advantages and disadvantages of a particular approach. First, observational research comes in structured and unstructured format. When it's structured, that means the observation that we intend to look at is actually clearly defined. For example, perhaps we're interested in the number of products that a consumer touches while they're shopping in a retail store. If the, if the observation was to count the exact number of products they touched within a particular time frame, clearly we have a well-designed and well-structured set of measurement rules. On the other hand, a lot of observational research is unstructured. That is, we don't really set any particular rules of what we're looking for. Instead, we're merely looking out for consumer behaviors that seem interesting, important, or different than our expectations. This tends to be associated with exploratory research designs. Next, observational research can be either disguised or undisguised. If it's disguised, that means the participants in the study have no way of knowing that they're actually being observed. Of course, this creates some issues with marketing research ethics. But nonetheless, many of the observational research designs are disguised in applied marketing research. On the other hand, observational research that is undisguised means that the respondents do know that they're actually being watched by a researcher for research purposes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they know exactly what the study is about, however. Next, observational research can be either in a natural or contrived setting. In a natural setting, we are literally doing the observation of consumer behavior in a natural retail environment or some other natural consumer environment. In a contrived setting, we, the researchers, have either created some sort of laboratory in which we observe people behave, or we've artificially constructed the natural environment in such a way to serve our particular purposes. Finally, when it comes time to actually documenting those observations, we, we use either human or mechanical observation. For human observation, the human is literally the person responsible for observing and coding the observations. In mechanical observations, we're relying on some other device to first capture and sometimes even code the information. So we might use a camcorder or an eye tracker or an audio recording device. Next, let's introduce a few examples of observational research used in marketing research, and we'll explain the four different dimensions of which each one of these designs breaks, off, breaks down across. Enviracell is one of the most famous marketing research companies that engages in a lengthy amount of observational research. They use a variety of observational and observational communication-based hybrids. For example, they often do consumer tracking studies through a retail environment. The image that you're seeing here is an EnviroCell employee tracking where a particular consumer walked through as they are walking through a particular retail store. This is literally their path of purchasing. In this particular case, the study was structured because it's clear that we're, the observation is to track where people have gone. It's undisguised. In this case, the participant in the study is aware that an EnviroCell employee is following them as they're engaging in shopping. It's natural, it's happening in a regular store, and a human is the person responsible for actually observing the measurement. Another example from EnviroCell is using qualitative evaluation of shopper behavior observed via secretly placed cameras. In this case, EnviroCell or some other company would place cameras where individuals are not aware that they're being recorded. Then, hours upon hours of videotape are recorded and documented by EnviroCell employees. In this case, EnviroCell may not be engaging in any sort of structured observation. Instead, they may be watching for surprising patterns or unexpected behaviors that weren't a priori specified in the research design. Therefore, in this case, it might be unstructured uh, observational research. It's definitely occurring in a disguised space. People in the study aren't aware that they're being observed. It's still in a natural setting, but this time we're rely relying on mechanical observation to document the data. 
Next, I'd like to provide you with an illustration of a contrived observational research environment. Procter & Gamble has the famous innovation center called the Beckett Ridge Innovation Center. It's very secret about what goes on inside this innovation center. However, the things that we do know is that there is a model supermarket built inside this center. There's a model upper income US household, and there is a virtual reality center as well. So quite literally, if you found yourself as a consumer hired in to per participate in a study in the Beckett Ridge Innovation Center, you may walk through a model supermarket that's entirely fabricated and created to suit the needs of Procter & Gamble's marketing researchers. This image that you see here is literally a picture of the model home that's inside the P&G Innovation Center. Here I'm highlighting two of the secret cameras, or not so secret cameras, that are used to monitor participants in the studies as they engage and interact in their environment. The whole purpose of the Beckett Ridge Innovation Center is to understand how consumers interact in their home and shopping environments to better understand what types of products could be created by Procter & Gamble to serve the needs of consumers. In this particular instance, we might imagine the study as being either unstructured or structured. It's clearly undisguised. If you're hired to go to the Beckett Ridge Innovation Center to participate in a study, you are aware that you're in a study. So it's clearly also a contrived setting. I don't think anybody actually lives in this particular home that's inside this giant complex. And using video cameras, there's mechanical observation occurring. Next, I'd like to provide an example of a hybrid observation slash communication based marketing research study. This is a study that comes from Dixon and Sawyer in 1990 in the Journal of Marketing. Marketing researchers were hired to act as secret agents inside a grocery store. They pretended like they were stocking shelves, so they weren't actually dressed like ninjas. As people were shopping in an everyday normal setting, as people approached a particular section of the grocery store, the observation occurred. The marketing researchers tracked the number of different products that the people touched, how much time they stood in front of a place before they made a purchase decision, and ultimately which product they selected. So this was the observation component. As soon as the person actually made their selection for the product they wanted to buy, then the secret marketing researcher introduced themselves to the shopper, paid them a dollar, and then asked them a series of survey questions. For the observational component of this study, the, st the researchers learned that on average, people spent about 12 seconds at the particular product category, but 42% of them spent less than five seconds, and 85% of the individuals shopping only handled the selected brand that they actually purchased. In terms of the survey that happened after the observational period, about 58% of the people who were participated in the study said that they actually checked the price of the selection before they actually picked the product to buy. However, many of them said they didn't even bother to check the price. And of those who didn't check the price at all, 67.8% said that price wasn't very important to them. And then, by merging the observation and the communication-based stats together, Dixon and Sawyer were able to investigate a, a marketing research question that has been troubling marketers for a long time. Are people actually able to recall how much they're paying for the product they're, they're picking to purchase? And in this case, it was a very strong test. These people literally just picked the product that they intended to buy. So could they recall the price accurately even just a few seconds after they made their choice? 20% of the shoppers didn't even bother to guess what the price was. They had no idea. 47% were in fact correct on the price, but when people were wrong, people tended to guess downward. In other words, if they actually paid $2, we might expect the people to guess, say, $1.75. So even only a few moments after we pick a product, people tended to downward bias their estimates of what they might actually have paid. These results, of course, very interesting to marketing researchers, especially those who are selling uh, in the business of selling CPGs. Hybrid observation and communication-based research also exists in the digital space. Luth Research is a famous San Diego-based marketing research company, and they have a product and service called ZQ Intelligence. How this product works is they recruit a large panel of nationally representative consumers, and they pay them an amount of money to have those consumers install tracking software on all of their devices, laptops, phones, tablets. The nice thing about this from a marketing research perspective is that means they're able to track how a single person moves from path to purchase as they shop on their tablet, laptop, or phone. So if you first checked out a product on Amazon on your laptop, but later ultimately culminated the purchase on your phone two weeks later, ZQ Intelligence would be able to track that. In addition, this tracking is geo-aware. So Luth Research is actually able to tell where these particular people are when they're using particular devices, when they're going to make their purchases. But all this is observation-based research. We still aren't privy to the internal state of the consumer mind. That's where the survey-based component comes in. Well, those consumer members who are part of ZQ Intelligence are able to immediate prompts to take surveys at different intervals. These people can talk about their attitudes, beliefs, and other things that couldn't be understood about the consumer merely by observation. 
So when we're engaging in observational research, what are some of the pros and cons that motivate us to pick a particular choice? Well, some of the advantages of observational research are pretty apparent. First of all, we have insights into the actual behavior rather than someone's reported behavior. In addition, by observing what people actually do, there's no risk of intentional false response. Maybe a consumer is embarrassed to say how much money they spend on pizza every week. But if we have the right observational research technique, we'll know how much money they spend on pizza. But there are definitely some challenges associated with observational research. For doing non-mechanical observational research, meaning we're actually using humans to directly collect the data, it tends to be quite expensive. There's often general generalizability concerns because of this small sample size. Of course, this can be overcome by merely spending more money and thinking more carefully about the way we go about collecting our data. In addition, one of the problems that occurs for this type of observational research is now the observer themselves, the marketing researcher responsible for collecting the data, becomes a source of subjectivity. Perhaps this individual has to make judgment calls about whether or not a person really is standing in front of a shelf when they're engaging in a purchase. Or maybe they have to make a judgment call about whether or not a person was actually handling a product in a retail store to make it count as actually observing the product for purchase. In these situations, we introduce a new potential source of subjectivity. Finally, by observing people's behaviors, we can only make inferences about their underlying motivational attitude and belief states. We don't really know why people are doing the things that they are actually doing. Only communication-based research techniques can get directly at those things. In addition, there's some other problems that can occur with certain types of observational research. One of the things that often exists in observational research where the respondent is aware that they're being observed is a so-called Hawthorne or observer effect. In other words, you behave differently when you're being watched. You're seeing an image of a panopticon here, which illustrates that concept. Or for those of you who like reality TV, think of it as the big brother effect. People simply behave differently when, they're, when they know they're being observed by others. There's also demand effects. If a person knows they're being studied, they may consciously make a choice to engage in different behaviors than they otherwise would because they're trying to guess about what the expectations of the research study are. For example, here we see the McDouble sandwich. It's just like the normal double cheeseburger minus one slice of cheese. Before McDonald's rolled out this new product years ago, they did some test marketing to observe if people were still willing to buy a double cheeseburger sans one slice of cheese. Well, people in those test markets found out that the McDouble was being experimented with, and there was a bit of outcry on the internet, and people were suggesting that they should consciously not purchase the product in order to make sure it didn't nationally roll out. Clearly, this idea of protesting the marketing research study is a demand effect. That's not something that would normally occur in everyday human behavior. Fortunately for those people who really didn't want the McDouble sandwich, it's still on the dollar menu today. Of course, there's a variety of other observational research techniques as well. Protocol analysis, eye tracking studies, online walled communities, secret shoppers, garbology. Garbology being where you observe the trash that people throw away to make inferences about what their previous behaviors were. And neuromarketing research are just some examples. Let me give you just a few more before we wrap up our conversation today. Protocol analysis is a type of observational research blended with communication-based research. According to Erickson in 2002, protocol analysis is a rigorous methodology for eliciting verbal reports of thought sequences as a valid source of data on thinking. Put another way, while people are engaging in behaviors, we as marketing researchers would often like to know what's exactly going on in their head. In theory, a protocol analysis study is capable of eliciting those thoughts out loud. Usertesting.com is a website that, is, that illustrates the idea of using protocol analysis to answer marketing research questions. Let's imagine you're a marketer who just designed a new website. You would like to know how people think about solving problems like searching for particular products they want to buy while they're clicking on your new website interface. Well, if you hired a batch of respondents on usertesting.com, you could have them go through a series of design tasks and then have them elicit out loud, which would be captured via their microphone and their laptop at home, what they were thinking as they were clicking through different components of your website. In the screenshot that you see here, you can see on the bottom third so a series of the different tasks that are being asked, being asked of the respondent to do. And on the far right hand side, you can see some documentation of the elicited responses. In other words, if a person was confused at a particular place and they said so out loud, it could be documented here. Eye tracking studies have also become increasingly popular in marketing research. In particular, they're very good for learning how to design good user interfaces and how, for, how to tailor your advertisements. What you see here is just one image of a, of a typical eye tracking device that's used today in the market. Take notice of these two spots that are highlighted by arrows. The arrow to the left is pointing at the camera that's looking out to the world. Therefore, the marketer is capable of seeing approximately where an individual is looking. 
But of course, if it's an eye tracking study, we need to know to know, we need to know exactly where they're looking. Now look at the arrow that's on the right hand side. There's little tiny cameras at the bottom end of the glasses that are actually pointed at the individual's eye. These cameras track where a person's eyes moved. By taking where a person's eyes moved and merging it with where they were looking at via the other camera, it's, cap it's possible to understand exactly where a person was looking in space in real time. Take a look at this advertisement of this cute baby associated with additional text on the right hand side. Now the advertiser's goal here is hopefully that you'll look at the baby, which will then draw you in towards looking at the text what you see on top of all these images is a heat map from an eye tracking study. The red spot right over the baby's face confirms the thing that, that you probably already know. People inherently spend time looking at things that look like people's faces, like cute little babies in magazine ads. However, we also tend to look where people tell us to look, even if they're not real people. Here's an alternative version of the advertisement. Again, individuals are looking closely at the baby, but this time the baby's eye gaze is pushing you towards the text, and again, we see that individuals are indeed looking and spending more time engaging with the text. This is an example of an experiment where observational data via eye tracking study was used to address a research question.